one of the most difficult balancing acts in the practice is to find the balance between effort and patience. Because on the one hand, we're, we're exhorted to put forth the kind of effort that a person who knows that his head is on fire would exert to put the fire out. In other words, you can't be lazy, you can't be complacent. Greed comes in, and you can't say, well, it's okay this time. Because then the question is, well, when are you going to finally decide that it's not okay? It has to be not okay now. But then there's patience, because sometimes it won't just go right away. You have to work at it, and sometimes the the techniques that work, that actually get rid of the patients, take time. Get rid of them, excuse me, get rid of the greed or the anger or delusion, they take time. And it's easy enough to give similes for this. You know, proper effort is like when you're growing a plant. On the one hand, you can't just let it fend for itself. You've got to water it, especially in a place like this where it doesn't rain for months at a time. You've got to water it, look after it. You can't just leave it on its own. But at the same time, you can't get impatient about its growing. In other words, you plant it today and you can't want to have a tree tomorrow. I like the story they tell in Thailand of the person who plants rice and within a few days it's only a few inches out of the ground and you know that it's got to be a couple feet tall before it's going to start giving the rice. So you pull it up to make it several feet tall. Of course, what happens? You can't stretch the plant that way. What happens is that the roots come out of the ground, the plant can die. So it's easy enough to give images for this that help with an explanation. Okay, you work on the causes and you stick with the causes and you have to be patient about waiting for the results. But finding the proper balance in your actual practice as you're dealing with it, things as they come up in the mind, that's something that you have to learn from your own experience trial and error, what works, what doesn't work, how much you can expect to sort of clear delusion out of your mind, how much you can expect to clear distraction out of the mind at any given time. That's something you have to learn by trial and error. And again, the causes have to be right in an all-around sort of way. Remember that the path is a path with eight factors. We tend to forget that. We want to reduce everything to one simple little practice. Say, just mindfulness, or just concentration, or just discernment, and it doesn't work that way. If there were factors in the path that were unnecessary, the Buddha wouldn't have included them. There'd be no reason for him to do it. You have to assume that everything there on the path is there for a good reason. You also have to assume that there's no shortcut around outside the path. Many times we like to figure things out beforehand. We think, well, maybe if we could just kind of reason our way through the various riddles posed by the mind. For example, where is the line drawn between the mind and its objects? I think we can like to figure it out beforehand. But there's not one pa factor in the path that would be called right figuring out beforehand. There's right view, there's right result, but there's not right figuring out beforehand. So you look at what the path actually says. Right view starts out with conviction in the principle of karma. Okay, that the happiness and the, the pleasure and the pain, the happiness and the sorrow you meet with depend on your actions, come from your actions. Your actions are real. You're the one responsible for doing them, and they give results in line with the intention. That's how much you're asked to believe. Now notice, it's not a belief system, it's a belief tool, it's something to work with. And then from there you go on to right resolve. Okay, you realize okay, that mental states that involve sensuality, ill will, 
harmfulness. These are things that you just, just don't want. They're bad karma. They're unskillful actions. And so you try to promote resolves that lead in the other direction, to renunciation. No ill will for anyone. Harmlessness. You try to foster those resolves in your mind. It's on top of that that the precepts are built. It's also on top of that that right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, the factors of the willed factors in the meditation, they grow. In other words, instead of trying to figure things out beforehand, you just look, are there unskillful mental qualities in your mind right now? Pay attention to what's happening right now. And when you see anything unskillful arising, you try to get rid of it, and you try to prevent it from arising again. This is one of the reasons why we practice concentration, is to, to sort of block these unskillful things from coming into the mind. So you give rise to skillful states in their stead, and then you try to maintain and develop them. This starts with mindfulness and goes up through the other factors of awakening, which basically are a recipe for doing concentration practice, getting the mind absorbed, still alert and thoroughly absorbed in, in a sense of full body awareness. Okay, those are things you can do. So you focus on what you can do. And from that point, right view takes on another level, seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, which are not particularly beliefs again. They're categories for sorting out your experiences. Okay, which experiences are suffering? Which experiences are the cause of suffering? Usually we have it all mixed up. Which things you do are the path? Which things you do are the cause of suffering? It's not just passive experiences, because experience involves intention. There's a sutra where the Buddha says, even just your basic experience of form, feeling, perception, and the rest of the aggregates, there's an intentional element in all of them. So what you've got to do is learn how to make those intentions skillful. And you can only do that by watching what's going on and experimenting. With the way your mind is running, okay? Who's in charge here? Who's giving the orders? That kind of question can cause all kinds of problems, but the question is, okay, exactly what intention is in charge of your mind right now? Is it skillful or unskillful? That kind of question can take you someplace. So it's a question of being clear about the questions you ask yourself. And try to ask questions in line with the Four Noble Truths. Learn how to sort out what's going on right now in those terms. And remember, each truth has a task try to comprehend suffering, something that we don't usually try to comprehend. We try to run away from it. But learn how to watch it, comprehend it. See what else arises every time there is suffering in the mind, every time there's stress in the mind. You can see this most clearly when the mind is most still. So you try to develop the factors of the path. Watch for suffering until you can see the cause that goes along with it. Then you abandon the cause. So there's very little figuring out beforehand and a lot of effort put into seeing clearly in the present moment, getting the mind still enough so it can see clearly, and then learning how to ask the right questions. What happens as a result is things open up in a way that couldn't happen if you tried to organize them or sketch them out beforehand. It's a process of discovery. The Buddha gives you the tools for discovery, how to look, where to look. And what to do with what you find. So we have to resist the tendency to want to get it all figured out beforehand. And just stick with the process. Okay, this is one way this is one way in which patience is very important in the practice. Realizing that if there were a quicker way, the Buddha would have taught it. If you
you could boil it down to just say being non-reactive, or just being open, or any of those other one-word formulas you often hear. It just doesn't work. I mean, think about it. If the Buddha had the opportunity to boil it down to one thing, he would have. He would have a lot less that he would have had to teach. But the truth of the matter is the practice can't be simplified any more than the Buddha already has. And there are no shortcuts. So you try to develop them, mind you. You water the qualities of concentration and mindfulness. You water whatever other skillful qualities you can find. And you weed out the unskillful ones. And as you're persistent in this, okay, they grow. Sometimes they grow faster than you might expect, sometimes more slowly. But as long as you're looking after them properly, they'll take care of the rest. <laughs>